Welcome back. We have started to scratch the surface of the Solutions to Physics GRE GR1777. We are currently on problem number 11. Characteristic x-rays appearing as sharp lines on a continuous background are produced when high energy electrons bombard a metal target. Which of the following processes results in the characteristic x-rays? So characteristic x-rays are emitted when outer shell electrons fill a vacancy in the inner shell of the atom, releasing x-rays in a pattern that are characteristic to each element. They are produced when, high, when an element is bombarded with high energy particles, and so that is answer C. Number 12, a single electron atom has the electron in the L equals 2 state. The number of allowed values of the quantum number M subscript L is, so there's going to be 2L plus 1 possible states for a given L, and so we know that L equals 2 in this problem, so therefore 2 times 2 is 4, plus 1 equals 5, and that is answer E. Number 13, a particle of mass m is confined inside a one-dimensional box, an infinite square well, of length a. The particle's ground state energy is which of the following? So this is going to be an equation we're going to have to memorize throughout the exam. It's going to be the one-dimensional particle in a box energy. And it is E equals n squared h bar squared pi squared over 2ml squared where m is the mass and l is the length of the box in, in our problem a is the length so a equals l and n is going to equal one for the ground state so we simply have e equals h bar squared pi squared over 2 m a where a is the length squared and so that is answer d Number 14, the Planck length is the only combination of the factors g, Newton's gravitational constant, h bar, Planck's constant divided by 2 pi, and c, the speed of light that has units of length. Which of the following gives the Planck length? So we're going to do some dimensional analysis. You get to see your front sheet of constants. We can combine them all, and you can see h bar is going to be meters squared, kilogram per second. That's our action. G is going to be meters cubed per kilogram second squared, and C is meters per second. So combine all these in the way that gives length, and the only way to do it, um, the combination of these constants that results in the units of length, is answer A. Number 15, the speed of light inside a non-magnetic dielectric material with a dielectric constant of 4.0 is, well, we know that C, the speed of light, equals 1 over EO, UO, that quantity, uh, square root, um, and where E is the electric constant and UO is the magnetic constant, and so we have our speed of light in the dielectric material. Um, so that is going to be 1 over, and we know it's 4, so 1 over 4 times EOUO, that quantity square root. Um, and so take the square root of 1 over 4, basically, that equals 1 over 2 times the original speed of light. Um, we know that the original speed of light, we're going to see our front page again for constants, where it's 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So 1 half of that is simply answer C. Number 16, Fermat's principle of ray optics states, a ray of light follows the path between two points which requires the least time. The principle can be used to derive which of the following? Um, so Fermat's principle of least time for ray optics can be used to derive properties of reflection off of mirrors, refraction through media, which is Snell's law, and total internal reflection. The Riley criterion Relates to wave relates wavelength to resolution. Um, it does not relate to the principle of least time, so therefore it is only going to be D number one and two. And as I've um, pointed out before, let's keep track of how much the people taking the exam got the problem right or wrong. And we can see that 53% uh, of test takers got this correct. So 
Um, as we go through these problems, we can refer to this number below and see kind of how everybody else did as well compared to our confidence level in each problem. Number 17, consider two identical systems, one and two, each consisting of a planet in circular orbit uh, about a much heavier star. For system one, the radius of the orbit is A, and for system two, the radius of the orbit is 4A. Which of the following gives the ratio T1 over T2 uh, of the period of system one to the period of system two? So we know Kepler's third law, the orbital period t equals 2 pi times the quantity a cubed divided by gm, that quantity a cubed divided by gm, that quantity square root. So t1 equals 2 pi times the quantity a cubed over gm, that quantity square root. Uh, t2 equals 2 pi over 4a, that quantity 4a cubed divided by gm, and then that whole quantity square root. And so that's going to equal 16 pi times the square root of a cubed over gm. Uh, so we can see 2 pi divided by 16 pi. That's going to be t1 divided by t2. The others cancel out. Um, that cancels out. That cancels out. So it's going to be 2 pi. That divided by that is going to be t1 divided by t2 is going to equal 1 over 8. And that is answer D. Number 18, two identical satellites, A and B, are in circular orbits around Earth. The orbital radius of A is twice that of B. Which of the following gives the ratio of the angular momentum of A to the angular momentum of B? So angular momentum equals L equals MVR, and T equals 2 pi R over V, and that also equals 2 pi times the quantity square root of A cubed over GM. And as the problem stated, 2 times the radius of B equals the radius of A, and the mass of B equals the mass of A. So 1 over V uh, is equal to the square root of R. And 1 over V of A equals the square root of 2R. And so V of A is going to equal 1 over the square root of 2R. V of B is going to equal 1 over the square root of R. And V of A over V of B is going to equal 1 over the square root of 2. So now let's plug that into our angular momentum, and so we know V and we know R. So uh, the angular momentum L of A equals MV times 2R over the square root of 2. Uh, the angular momentum of B equals uh, MVR, and L of A over L of B equals 2 over the square root of 2 equals the square root of 2, and that is answer C. Number 19, a 10 kilogram box slides horizontally without friction at a speed of one meter per second. At one point, a constant force is applied to the box in the direction of its motion. The box travels five meters with the constant force applied. The force is then removed, leaving the box with a speed of two meters per second. Which of the following is the magnitude of the applied force? So we know that work equals the force times x2 minus x1, that's force times distance, so work equals the force times five meters. Work also equals the change in kinetic energy, so the work equals one half mv final squared minus one half mv initial squared, and so our work equals one half times ten times two meters per second squared minus one half times ten times one meter per second squared. And remember, I'm trying not to muddle these problems by throwing in all of the units, but we're gonna, if you want to go and throw in the units for yourself, you know what they should be based on the problem. So our work is going to equal 20 joules minus 5 joules, that's going to equal 15 joules. And so as we did above, our work equaled our force times our distance. So 15 joules is equivalent to the force times our 5 meters, uh, our x2 minus x1, our distance. So therefore the force is going to have to be 3 newtons, and that is answer C. Number 20, what is the magnitude of the magnetic field at the center of a circular conducting loop of radius A that is carrying current I? So B is going to equal UOI over 4 pi R squared times R uh, times the integral of uh, d theta, and we're doing it from 0 to 2 pi. And we can see our diagram below right here for a visual representation of what we're doing. And so B is going to equal... 2 pi UOI over 4 pi R, and B is going to equal UOI over 2 R, where 2 pi R is the circumference of the circular conducting loop, and A equals R in this problem. 
So UOI over 2R is UOI over 2A. That is answer D.